The following is a class on Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 14, Text 5, given by His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj, recorded on February 12, 1995, in Mumbai, India. Sadhu Vira Tvaya Prishtam Avatar Katham Hare Yatvam Prichasi Marjanam Mrityu Pasha Vishatani The great sage Maitreya said, O warrior, the inquiry made by you is just befitting a devotee because it concerns the incarnation of the Personality of Godhead. He is the source of liberation in the chain of birth and death for all those who are otherwise destined to die. Report by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedan Swami Prabhupada. The great sage Maitreya addressed Vidura as a warrior, not only because Vidura belonged to the Kuru family, but because he was anxious to hear about the chivalrous activities of the Lord in his incarnations of Varaha and Narasimha. Because the inquiries concerned the Lord, they were perfectly befitting a devotee. A devotee has no taste for hearing anything mundane. There are many topics of mundane warfare, but a devotee is not inclined to hear of them. The topics of the warfare in which the Lord engages do not concern the war of death, but the war against the chain of maya, which obliges one to accept repeated birth and death. In other words, one who takes delight in hearing the war topics of the Lord is relieved from the chains of birth and death. Foolish people are suspicious of Krishna's taking part in the battle of Kurukshetra, not knowing that his taking part ensured liberation for all who were present on the battlefield. It is said by Bhishma Dev that all who were present on the battlefield of Kurukshetra attained their original spiritual existences after death. Therefore, hearing the war topics of the Lord is as good as any other devotional service. Again, we are celebrating this auspicious Dwadasi, which commemorates the appearance of that great, illustrious incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Shivaraha Dev. This beautiful story is narrated by Maitreya Muni to Vidura in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Vidura is inquiring in so many ways for so many details to understand more and more about the wonderful incarnations of the Supreme Lord. And here in Maitreya, is praising Vidura, who was taking a position of Maitreya's disciple because he was so concerned to hear the glories of the Lord. It is explained that the Lord's pastimes liberate one from the cycle of birth and death. But it is necessary that one is hearing from the perspective of a devotee. And one is hearing from one who is a devotee. Otherwise, the real transmission of spiritual grace cannot take place. Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead is independent. He can appear when and where he wants to appear. No one can force him to appear. You cannot force him to appear in his name. 
You cannot force him to appear in the sound of his pastimes. He appears when he is pleased. When he is pleased by the devotion of the speaker and by the sincerity of one who comes to hear. It is a fact that sometimes a genuine speaker of Krishna Katha may be giving the narrations of the Lord's pastimes. And there may be a room full of various people, of various stages of consciousness. And through the same vibration, from the same bona fide source, Krishna may be revealing such wonderful, purifying grace upon one, and he may not reveal anything to another in the same assembly. According to our motivation, according to our purpose, in which we have come to hear. So therefore, we should know that Krishna's grace is always upon those who are sincerely aspiring to be his devotees. Bhaktiya tvananyaya shakyam aham evam Krishna says it is only through devotion that I reveal myself, either physically in his divine spiritual form, through his name, through his pastimes, through his qualities, or even through the murti, the deity of the Lord. He reveals his actual spiritual nature when we are sincere to be his servant and the servant of his servants, when we are sincere to hear his glories eternally for his pleasure and for our purification. Because as we become purified, we are given a greater service to the Lord. It is not a question of what our service is. It is a question of the consciousness in which we perform our service. It is not a matter of what ashram or varna we may be temporarily placed. But the sincerity to please the Lord. And of course, to the extent we are purified, to that extent, whatever we do, we could do it in a way that is more pleasing to Krishna. Therefore, it is always foremost in a devotee's consciousness to become purified. So whatever we do for the Lord will be that much more satisfying for his transcendental pleasure. Vidura was so anxious. He left his home. And how he left, we all know the story. He was humiliated. He was disgraced threatened. In fact, if he didn't leave Duryodhana, he threatened that you will not even have the chance to breathe while you still have your breath get out from this palace. And Vidura was simply a well-wisher. He saw that Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra were on the path to hellish condition of bondage. He could have easily lived comfortably in that palace and said nothing. But he was a Vaishnav. He was compassionate. He was willing to take great risks to try to help those who he loves. This is a real loving family member. Sometimes in families, people just to try to keep harmony They say nothing, but Vidura disrupted the whole family by his preaching. But he didn't mind, because he saw that they were offenders to God and offenders to the devotees. So he was kicked out of Hastinapur, and he took it as God's grace. And he went, ultimately, to the lotus feet of Maitreya Muni and began to have a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And in this discussion, Maitreya is explaining how the Lord appeared in so many wonderful incarnations and why. He describes that the four Kumaras, they were very senior sons of Lord Brahma. In fact, these four Kumaras were four of the original children of Lord Brahma in this universe. They are the elder brothers of Shiva and practically all of the other Prajapatis. 
And of course, when Lord Brahma was creating as a service to the Lord, he had to progenate so many species of life. So he was ordering his sons to be prajapatis, which means that they should marry and have so many, so many children. And he would empower them to populate the whole universe, various planets. So he told the Kumaras that you should marry and you should have so many wonderful children on my order. And the Kumaras, they were thinking, get married? Have children? So much bondage, so much disturbance, so many unnecessary duties. No, we will remain brahmacharis. Now, even today, most fathers are not very inclined towards such a decision by a son. Of course, Brahma was doing it as a service to the Lord. They were interfering with his service. So he ordered them, no. I am your father. I am telling you. It is my instruction. You must marry. You must have children. And the Kumara said, we're sorry, but we will not obey this instruction. Anything else, but not this. We will remain brahmacharis and we will remain free from any designations that cause material entanglement. So Brahma became very angry. And from his anger, Lord Rudra came from between his eyebrows. And this is how Shiva was born within this material universe. As the son of Brahma, as a result of the anger toward the Kumaras. But anyways, Brahma had so many other children and he saw the virtue of the Kumaras, Brahmacharya. They were such wonderful preachers. So he accepted them. He was their guru. And he explained the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead to them. And it is explained, although the four Kumaras heard the glories of Bhagavan, Sri Krishna, Lord Narayan. And they were aspiring sincerely as devotees. They had only realized the platform of Brahman. They had partially realized their ultimate goal. The monistic conception of liberation in the impersonal Brahman is a partial realization of the Lord. They were not Mayavadis. A Mayavadi is one who says the impersonal feature of the Lord is supreme and the personal feature is Maya. It is temporary. It is a product of material modes of nature. But they were Brahmavadis, which mean essentially they were devotees and they were seeking the realization of the personality of Godhead, but they had only come to the stage of realizing that liberated state of Brahman. So, on one occasion, they decided to go to visit Lord Narayan in Vaikuntha. And the four Kumaras, they were very powerful yogis who had great control over their mind and senses. And they preserved the form of children of only four years old. That is why they are called Kumaras. The reason is as the Acharyas explain, that when you get older, naturally, you attain a stage where sex desire comes into your mind. And at that time, so many disturbances, so many frustrations come into life. One who has no sex desire is utterly innocent. So they wanted to remain innocent. So they simply decided that they would keep their bodies four years old for the entire span of the creation. And as children, they were given entrance anywhere. Srila Prabhupada explains, a child could go anywhere and do anything and nobody really takes offense. If an adult tries to get away with things that children can do, people become very offended. But children are innocent. So they go, they play. Just like if there is a very big, powerful, prestigious man, if someone comes and jumps on him, 
he will become very offended. But if a child comes and jumps in him, he'll laugh. He'll say, oh, Haribo, very nice. You are very nice. So the Kumaras, they would go anywhere in utter childlike innocence. And they were totally liberated souls. So they came to Vaikuntha Dham. And there were seven gates. And they passed through the first six gates. And no one dared to check them. They wore no clothes at all. In fact, it is said they were clothed by the environment, the four directions. And wherever they went, because they just felt they had the right to be anywhere, they had such confidence that people would just allow them to pass. Such purity. Each of these gates of Vaikuntha were made out of gold and rubies and diamonds and emeralds. And then they came to the seventh gate. And there were two doorkeepers of the name Jai and Vijay. And as the Kumaras just walked right by them, they took their clubs and they put it in front and said, you have no right to come here. You are children. This is serious business going to see Narayan. So they checked them. And the Kumaras, who were so anxious to go to have the darshan of Lord Narayan, who were so anxious to go to serve his lotus feet, they became angry. Now you may ask why a liberated soul becomes angry. They were devotees. Why a devotee becomes angry? Generally people feel that if you are advanced spiritually, there should be no anger. You should just be like a piece of stone, just tolerate anything and everything. But this anger is actually a transcendental attribute which decorates the disposition of the great devotees. A devotee does not become materially angry. But what is the difference between material anger and the anger of a devotee? It is said that anger is the younger brother of lust or material desire in this world. When our material desires, our ambitions, are frustrated, we become angry. When someone or something comes to impede our sense gratification, whether it be gross sense gratification to experience the pleasures of the senses, or whether it be subtle sense gratification in the form of our dignity or our prestige being confronted, being checked, we become angry. That is material anger. Krishna says in Gita that lust is the great enemy of this world and from lust anger is born. But for a devotee, when his service to the Lord is being impeded, he becomes angry. That is called transcendental anger. And that anger is actually pure because it is not for his satisfaction, it is for Krishna's satisfaction. If we want to do something wonderful for Krishna and there is someone or something that is obstructing that service, then we become angry. And materialistic foolish people cannot understand unless they understand the principles of true bhakti. Hanuman was very angry because Ravana was interfering with his service to the Lord of bringing Sita back. And Arjuna became very angry because the Kurus were interfering with his service to the Lord to establish Dharma in the world. In the same way, the Kumaras were going to Vaikuntha to worship the lotus feet of the Lord to serve him. And these people were impeding their service, so they became very angry. And they spoke, Who are you? What are you doing here? This is Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha is a place of harmony. The material world is a place of disharmony. That is actually the difference between the material world and the spiritual world. In this material world, there is so much disharmony amongst living beings because there are so many self-centered desires that everyone has. 
as they say, this is the world of the survival of the fittest. Jiva Jiva Sajivanam. That the stronger makes prey out of the weaker. And on every level of life we see this. In our family, usually the big brother beats up the small brother. Disharmony. And then as they get bigger, all sorts of other things start happening. Strong nations. The other day we were describing World War II, how the German army, they were stronger, so they just conquered and massacred so many nations and subjugated them. And ultimately, there was an alliance which was stronger than them, and they were destroyed. So everyone is competing in this world for their own personal self-interest, either individual or collective. And therefore, this is a world of disharmony. And even when we become devotees, if we have material ambitions, if we have motivations for our own personal interests, there will be disharmony amongst devotees. But the spiritual world is the place of harmony. To go back to the material world, even in the animal species, they're all eating each other. They're all killing each other. They're all fighting with each other. They're all trying to survive at the expense of another. And even the germs in your body, they're eating each other. Bacterias are eating each other. In this way, from the lowest denomination of consciousness in this world up to the highest of the demigods. We read about so many things in the scriptures, stories, where the demigods are arguing, fighting, cursing each other. The material world is a place of disharmony on every level. And sometimes, for some short span of time, there may be some sense of harmony. But it cannot last because our material motivations will definitely spoil everything in due course of time. But in Vaikuntha, people leave aside their own personal motivations. Everyone is simply motivated for pleasing Krishna, for serving Krishna. And everyone knows that there's nothing that pleases Krishna more than when he sees the devotees are serving one another. So to please Krishna, we have to become the servant of the servant of the servant. We have to put our own desires, our own aspirations second to help another. And this is Vaikuntha. Srila Prabhupada prayed to all of his devotees to make his temples a Vaikuntha atmosphere where there's no anxiety due to disharmony, where everyone is working together for one purpose, to fulfill Krishna's desire, to fulfill Krishna's mission. Therefore, to hear the glories of the Lord, to chant the glories of the Lord, creates that. When we hear and chant our own glories, it creates disharmony. When we expect, rather than feel that there is something expected of us, it creates disharmony. Therefore, Mahaprabhu has said, Amani Ramanadena Kirtaniya Sadahari. The real harmony of Kirtan where everyone blends into one sweet mood of devotion, comes when we are willing to offer all respect to others and to expect no respect for oneself. That is Vaikuntha. That is the only stage of consciousness where there can be real peace and real love. So the four Kumaras were thinking, what is this? We have come to Vaikuntha, and yet these men are creating disharmony. What are you doing here? Are you imposters? We have come all this way in perfect harmony and now you are creating disturbance? You shouldn't be here. You are nonsense. Why you are stopping us? So they were very much disturbed. And similarly, when we're trying to serve our Guru Maharaj and Krishna, we should not allow anyone to stop us. There are so many gatekeepers in this material world trying to stop us from our devotional service. And if we just say, oh yes, you are good, I am good, then we will never be able to properly serve the Lord. So basically the Kumaras considered that these Jai and Vijay were in Maya. 
They were creating disharmony in the land of harmony. Therefore, they should not be here. So they cursed them to fall down to the material world where disharmony is acceptable. We're trying to help people forget God. It's acceptable. And when Jai and Vijay heard their curse, they fell at the feet of the four Kumaras and prayed, we have made a great mistake. Please forgive us. You can punish us in any way you like, but we have just one prayer. We want to atone for our sin that we have committed. Please know that is our heart. Wherever you cast us, in any species of life, in any of the lower planetary systems, there's only one prayer we have. Please, let us always remember the Supreme Personality of Godhood. We don't mind going anywhere or doing anything, but please do not put us in a situation where we forget Krishna. Just at that time, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Narayan, appeared on the scene along with his beloved consort Lakshmi Devi. He came in a great haste to the scene of this cursing. And when he appeared, both the four Kumaras as well as Jai and Vijay, they were able to witness directly with their own eyes the beauty of the Supreme Personality of God. His beautiful, beautiful moon-like face with lovely lotus-like eyes, every limb so perfectly attractive to the heart and soul of every living being, his graceful form decorated with the beautiful Vajayanti Mala, Koshtuba Mani. On that Mala of flowers, there were so many bumblebees, all anxious to drink the nectar and the honey. The Lord was so beautiful. And from the tulsi leaves that were decorating his lotus feet as well as decorating his garland, a breeze carried that fragrance into the nose of the four Kumaras. And the combination of seeing the beauty of the Lord and smelling the fragrance of the prasad of the Lord. They completely transcended their impersonal Brahman realization of the Lord and became purified bhaktas. They attained the state of Krishna Prema. Muktanam api siddhanam narayana parayana sadulava prasanatma kotishupi mahamune. Out of so many liberated souls and out of so many great personalities who have achieved all mystic yogic perfections the rarest and most fortunate person is one who has attained love for Narayan only such a person can experience real happiness real joy and real peace Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his explanation of the Atmarama verse that even the greatest persons in the most highly liberated, perfect state, when they come in contact with the personality of Godhead, they give up that condition of monism and surrender to the loving service of the Lord as his eternal servant. And the four Kumaras are the perfect example of this. People strive for mukti as the perfection of life, but we can understand by this story that bhakti is millions of times more wonderful than mukti because it is the eternal constitutional position of the soul. Rupa Goswami explains, compared to the pleasure of mukti, which is like one drop, bhakti is like a vast, unlimited, fathomless ocean. Because through mukti there is no real pleasure. Mukti is just a state where there is no pain. And for one who has been suffering, 
relief of pain appears to be pleasure. But bhakti is the true positive form of ecstasy, ananda, that the soul is seeking always. The four kumaras, in a mood of pure, unmotivated, uninterrupted love, they bow down and surrender to the feet of Lord Narayan. At that time, Lord Sri Narayan, he explained that I am very sorry. This Jai and Vijay are my devotees. They are my servants. And therefore, I am responsible for their conduct. Because they have offended you, who are devotees, they have committed this aparad to you, I am responsible. Whatever the servant does, the master is responsible for. And Srila Prabhupada explains how responsible a servant of the Lord must be, knowing this. Because whatever we do will either glorify or humiliate our Guru, the assembly of all the Vaishnavas, all the previous Acharyas, and Krishna and Radharani themselves. If we perform work that is unbecoming, it is a scar upon Guru, Vaishnavas, and Krishna. And the whole world will recognize that scar. It is the nature of love to want to glorify those we love, not to embarrass them, not to make a mockery out of them in front of others, but to speak of the world. When we misbehave, if we are known as devotees, people will think, this is what a devotee of Krishna is? This is what they do? This is what type of guru? This is what your guru teaches you? People will criticize your guru. They will criticize the line of parampara you stand for. And ultimately they will criticize Krishna. When Srila Prabhupada came to the West, although he was teaching the highest, purest, most perfect philosophy, what attracted people to Krishna? It was his good behavior because he manifested so much the loving compassion of Krishna, because he was such a perfect friend of all living beings, because in every way he was such a gentleman. People were thinking, if he's a devotee of Krishna, Krishna must be good. I want to surrender to Krishna. I want to become the servant of the servant of Krishna. But at the same time, we see that in the world today there is many bad feelings toward the Krishna consciousness movement. The Krishna consciousness movement is Krishna. There's no difference between Krishna and his movement. Because sometimes devotees act foolishly. And people think, this is what type of crazy people are in this movement? What is the use of this movement? What is the use of this Krishna? So therefore, to carefully follow the four regulative principles, to be very good in every respect, and to be very strict in our devotional standards, is the greatest glorification of Guru and Krishna. Just to say, Guru Maharaj Ki Jai is not very great glorification, but to make your life and your example say, Guru Maharaj Ki Jai, That is great glorification. To be willing to make a sacrifice for the prestige and the glory of Krishna and his eternal associates. That is our duty. That is what a real devotee means. So Krishna explained in this way that this Jai and Vijay, they are my servitors. They are my devotees. So I must take the blame for what they have done. In this passage is a beautiful verse where the Lord says, Because I am the servitor of my devotees, my lotus feet have become so sacred that they immediately wipe out all sin. And I have acquired such a disposition that the goddess of fortune does not leave me. 
even though I have no attachment for her, and others praise her beauty and observe sacred vows to secure from her a slight favor. The relationship between the Lord and his devotees is so transcendentally beautiful. A devotee feels that because of my attachment to Krishna, because of the divine grace of the Lord, whatever good qualities are in me is by his mercy. A devotee considers that I have no good qualities. I'm nothing. I'm utterly useless without the divine grace of the Lord. And anything that a devotee does that appears very nice, a devotee gives all glory to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Not only through his mouth and through his actions, but in his heart he genuinely realizes that. That he is the source of all of our good qualities. Because I am aspiring for the dust of his lotus feet, therefore there is something of value in my life. But the Supreme Personality of Godhead thinks the same way about his devotees as it is revealed here. That because I am the servitor of my devotees, my lotus feet have become so sacred. All of the persons, all of the demigods, and all of the great yogis, and all of the great personalities throughout all the universes, and even in the spiritual world, they are all taking shelter of my lotus feet. And they are finding the greatest satisfaction from my lotus feet. But I will tell you a secret. Why my lotus feet have such quality? Because I am serving my devotees. Because I am a servitor of the Vaishnavas, therefore my lotus feet have developed these qualities. Srila Prabhupada, when so many thousands of people were taking shelter of the dust of his lotus feet, he said the same thing. Because I am serving Krishna, because I am serving the servants of Krishna, therefore my lotus feet can deliver all of you from the cycle of birth and death. So how transcendentally beautiful is the exchange of love between the Lord and his devotees. In the next verse, the Lord explains that I am the master of my unobstructed internal energy and the water of the Ganges is the remnant left after my feet are washed. That water sanctifies the three worlds along with Lord Shiva who bears it on his head. If I can take the dust of the feet of the Vaishnava on my head, who will refuse to do the same? In this way, the Lord is rejecting this idea of trying to approach him directly. He, the master of all the worlds, takes the dust from the feet of the Vaishnavas. What sane person will refuse to do the same? As Vrindavan Das Thakur explains in Chaitanya Bhagavat, that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to establish that the highest form of all worship is the worship of the Vaishnavas. So in this way, Lord Sri Narayan explained to the Kumaras that actually it is my desire that you cursed Jayan Vijay. The Lord explained to Jayan Vijay that I have the power to counteract this curse. In fact, if I order the Kumaras, they will retract the curse. The Lord explained that there's no reason why Jayan Vijay would stop such great sages from entering into Vaikuntha, into the palace of the Lord is because I wanted them to commit this offense that they made this offense. And there's no reason why the four Kumaras would curse in such a terrible way that for this offense they fall from the spiritual sky into this material world. But the Lord explains that it is my desire that this curse be. This is all my pastime. Now, he told Jai and Vijay, 
You go down to the material world to take lower birth. But I give you this word, you will never forget me. And you will assist me in my wonderful pastimes. And very soon you will return again back home, back to Godhead, to be in my association. And the Lord sought the approval of the four Kumaras. That please, let them never forget me. And please let them come back home to Vaikuntha as soon as possible. Which shows how the Lord is so sad when a living entity leaves his eternal loving service and how anxious he is for every living being to come back to the spiritual world to exchange love with him. So then they fell. They had to leave Vaikuntha and the demigods and so many great souls when they saw this happening they were astonished. And it so happened that Diti, who was the wife of Kashyapa, who was one of the sons of Brahma, she had a desire for children all of a sudden, uncontrollable. So she approached Kashyapa, and he was sitting in meditation at the sacrificial fire. He was a great yogi. And she said, My dear husband, Cupid's fiery arrows have entered my heart. I desire children. And the Acharyas explained that actually it is natural for a woman to want children. That Diti was one of the daughters of Daksha. And Daksha decided that all of his daughters should be married. And he allowed them to choose their own husbands. But they didn't just freely mingle with men like they do in the West to choose their own husbands. But rather, without even meeting them, without even seeing them, they would just analyze the qualities and the properties of certain great personalities. And usually they were too shy to tell their father. So through a sister or a maidservant or mother or somebody, they would relate their desired choice to the father. And ultimately it was for the father's approval. So Daksha married 13 of his daughters to Kashapa. And 12 of them, Kashapa gave very nice children. But Diti had no children. So she was thinking, why? All my co-wives have beautiful, beautiful children, and I have none. And Kashapa was expressing that you are so chaste, and you are so faithful, as much as any of the other co-wives, and I understand your desire, and I will certainly fulfill your desire to have children. But you have to wait, because it must be done at an auspicious time. Now we should know that this happened in Satya Yuga, and in the previous ages, every single thing you do or say is so technically precise in how responsible you are and what reaction you'll get. In mean, Kali Yuga, we don't have to be so worried about all of these technicalities. In Satya Yuga, if you think for a second of anything sinful, you have to suffer the reaction. In Kali Yuga, you can think, no reaction. But if your thinking causes you to do it or say it, then there is a great reaction. And we should know what we think is what we will say and what we will do unless we curb our thinking and correct it. So we have to control our mind very carefully from the very beginning. But in Satya Yuga, if a sinful thought comes to your mind, there's a terrible reaction. Because people were so highly qualified. If they did anything at a time that was inauspicious, there would be a terrible reaction. These days, nobody even knows what's auspicious or inauspicious. Therefore, the Shastra says that Wherever the chanting of the holy name of Vishnu is, that is all auspicious, and you don't have to worry about anything else. Forget all these other things. Just chant Hare Krishna. Tasmad Sankirtanam Vishnu Jagad Mangalam that wherever the Sankirtan of the name of Vishnu is, 
in this age of Kali, that is the supremely most auspicious place. We don't have to worry about whether a black cat crosses our trail. We don't have to worry about if a donkey passes on our left side. We don't have to worry about if a untouchable walks by us while we're carrying water. We don't have to worry about any astrological configurations in the sky, whether it's Shuni or anyone else, providing we're chanting the holy names of Krishna. <laughs> Because the chanting of the name of Krishna makes everything auspicious. Because Krishna is all auspicious. And Krishna's presence makes everything auspicious. Om apavitra apavitra va sarvavastam gatopiva yasmaret pundarika kyam asa yagandara suchi One who remembers Krishna becomes pure, however impure he is. And when we chant the name of Krishna, it creates purity and auspiciousness. But in those days, when they didn't have this Yuga Dharma of the chanting of Krishna's name as a concession to a totally inauspicious atmosphere, people were very highly responsible. They had to be very, very conscientious of everything they did and when and how. So Kashapa said, just wait a few seconds, then it will become auspicious. But now Shiva and the ghosts are passing overhead. This is interesting. Because Lord Shiva, who is an expansion of Lord Narayan, and who is in the role of the greatest of all devotees, Vaishnavanam Yata Shambhu, but he's so kind, he's so merciful, that he goes down to the lowest living creatures and gives them the chance to be elevated. Therefore he is called Bhuteshwar or Bhutanath, which means he's the lord of ghostly beings. And it is explained that generally ghostly beings don't have a physical body because they have abused their physical body, generally through suicide or dying in terribly intoxicated stages. But they still have all physical desires, so they're frustrated. So they worship Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva grants them the blessing by which they can take physical bodies. And the way they do that is when a man and a woman come together in wrong consciousness, in very, very materially lustful condition, the wrong time, the wrong state of mind, without any sense of religious principles, in such a state... Lord Shiva allows ghostly, terrible, horrible, violent beings to enter into that womb and take birth with a physical body. And sometimes we see in this world today, in this age of Kali, there's so many crazy people. It's unbelievable how crazy people become. In the West, there's big court cases where they found that people were killing children and eating them. And they found the bones. And they'd cook them and everything. But where does this desire come from to just kill little children, molest them, and eat them? I mean, it's, it's unthinkable. People are like that. It's not that they went to school to learn those things. It's not that they read books about it. It's, that's their nature. They're ghostly beings that somehow or other got physical bodies. There's so many murderers and rapists and cheaters and crazy beings, even taking forms of big, big leaders and exploiting people, wholesale murders. It's because in this age of Kali Yuga, there are so many ghostly beings in physical bodies who have so many terribly unthinkable states of consciousness that a pious people just cannot understand. How can a people think like this? How can they do like this? Generally, people 
get a ghostly body because they commit suicide. That means they lose their form. And those formless beings worship Lord Shiva. But then Lord Shiva also came as Shankaracharya, and he became the Lord of the Mayavadis. And Mayavadis also, they want to commit spiritual suicide. So Srila Prabhupada says they are also ghostly. <laughs> Sorry to say. A regular ghost commits physical suicide and they worship Shiva. And the Mayavadis, they want to commit spiritual suicide by losing their spiritual identity. So they also worship Shiva. So in both cases, he is Bhutanath. He is the Lord of Ghosts. <laughs> People who want to commit suicide either spiritually or physically. So he was explaining this to DT. But by the Lord's arrangement, she couldn't wait. So she took him by the cloth and pulled, and he just understood that this is the Lord's arrangement. <coughs> and he folded his palms and offered his respectful obeisances to Providence. <coughs> and at that time, Jayan Vijay falling from Vaikuntha, Dham, entered into the womb of Diti as brothers, Hiranyaksha and Hiranya Kashipu. And when they came into the earth, there was all sorts of tremendous, tremendous mishaps. Oh, everything inauspicious was seen everywhere. It was darkness and terrible storms and all pious people were feeling such suffering in their hearts and all impious people were feeling elated. And soon those two children were born. And Hiranyaksha was born first. which means he's the younger brother of Hiranyakashipu. Because babies kind of stand in line in the womb. The person who goes first is behind the person that comes second. So the person that comes first is second to the person that comes second. Arivo. You can listen to the tape a few times. And So oh, Hiranyaksha was the younger brother of Hiranyakashipu. And <coughs> he saw his brother was such a terrible demon, he wanted to conquer everything, everywhere, by all illegal means. And Hiranyaksha wanted to please him. So he took his mighty mace. And it is explained that Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu performed such tremendous austerities that they became so powerful. Their bodies were like mountains in size and, in, and in, in hardness. They were just undefeatable. Even the demigods were wreaked with fear upon the thought of them. And Hiranyaksha just went around destroying everyone and everything. <coughs> Conquering, subjugating, destroying. And the demigods were so afraid that they would all literally run away, abandon their abodes when they heard he was coming because they knew they did not have a chance but to speak of the residents of this earth. So he dove deep into the sea where he wanted to conquer and fight with Varuna, the lord of the oceans. He said, please, I have come as a beggar and the alms that I am begging from you is I want, I want you to fight with me so I can destroy you. Maruna said, I'm very old. I'm no match to you. Why do you want to waste your time with an old man like me? If you want to really fight with someone, you should fight with 
the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who has just now appeared. <coughs> so it is explained that Hiranyaksha, he created such terrible exploitation by stealing and plundering gold that it created such an imbalance in the earth that the earth actually fell to the bottom of the Garabodak Ocean. Srila Prabhupada actually explains that the foolish materialists who are so much plundering the earth of oil, they are also exploiting Mother Earth for their own materialistic sensual purposes. And it will create tremendous imbalance and it will create many disasters on this earth. It's interesting because in America, before <coughs> there was such an intense, immense lust for oil, they were getting most of their oil from Texas and Oklahoma, two southern states of America. At that time, they were not depending so much on the Gulf countries. So the name of oil was Texas Gold or black gold. Hiranyaksha was directly exploiting the earth of gold. And Srila Prabhupada compares that the people digging oil are taking another form of gold from the earth. And we see that these countries that have so much oil, they can get away with practically anything and no one can say anything because they want their oil. Exploitation. Now the whole civilization is based on that principle of great need. <coughs> so Hiranyaksha, through his exploitation of the earth, caused the earth to fall to the bottom of the Garabodak Ocean. At that time, Swayambhuva Manu approached Lord Brahma along with great saints and sages. And after offering prayers, they said that this is all living beings on the earth are in a very dangerous situation because the earth has fallen into the ocean. So oh, please, we have come to you to protect Mother Earth. So Brahma was thinking that only the Supreme Personality of Godhead can help us. What can we do? Even Brahma was unable to solve the problems of this world, which is a great lesson. From the biggest problem to the smallest problem, ultimately only Krishna can solve it. And if we think that we can do it ourselves without his help, that is our greatest illusion. So Brahma began to meditate on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Jagad Guru. And at just at that time, a little tiny boar, the size of the tip of a thumb, came out from the nose of Lord Brahma and it went into the sky and Brahma was thinking what is this? and all the saints and sages around were thinking what is this? and then the boar began to grow <coughs> he grew and grew until he was like a huge mountain and then they, they all began to speculate who is this? What is this? What is happening? We have never seen such a thing. But then the Lord began to roar. And when he roared, it was like the roaring of a mountain. And they could all understand that this was the Supreme Lord Narayan who has taken this most fantastic, unbelievable, incredible form. And then he began to grow in such size that he covered the entire sky. And the great saints and sages and the Devi Devatas, they began to offer prayers of love to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
glorifying his supreme, most transcendental position. And the Lord again, just to enliven his devotees, he began to roar, he began to slash his boar-like tail, and he cast his merciful glance upon them to tell them, there is nothing to fear, I have come. Now someone may think, how is this possible? What type of mythology do you Vaishnavas believe in? That God is a gigantic boar. Boar is a relative of the hog, the pig, which is not a very respectable, distinguished animal by any means. In fact, they are considered very lowly. But Krishna's body, Krishna's transcendental nature, is transcendental. Janma karma chame divyam evam yo viti tattvata tyaktvadeham punara janma naiti mamiti sorajuna. One who understands the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities will never have to take birth in this material world again, but attains my abode. If you want to go back to the spiritual world, you must have complete faith in the Lord's transcendental ability to do anything at any time (coughs) and his completely pure spiritual nature as the cause of all causes. If you do not have that faith, no matter what else you do, you cannot enter into the divine realm of pure love or bhakti. Therefore, it is essential that we associate with people who have faith in the wonderful pastimes of the Lord, in the teachings of the Lord. Because by associating with people with faith, we gain faith. And by associating with people who doubt and who are faithless, we also become plagued with the disease of doubt. Hearing in the association of the Lord and his devotees, the Lord's pastimes and teachings, is the means by which real faith is awakened and strengthened within our heart. Therefore, this is essential. Real human civilization is based on this principle of coming together in the association of devotees with faith and hearing and chanting the names and glories of the Lord. Therefore, this is essential. Real human civilization is based on this principle of coming together in the association of devotees with faith and hearing and chanting the names and glories of the Lord. It is the most essential part of our lives. It is not mythology. It is fact. What is it that the Lord cannot do? He has a chinti shakti. He has performed so many incredible miracles right in this world that we see with our own eyes that can never be duplicated by even the greatest thinkers of society. Achintya Shakti, inconceivable power. There's nothing that Krishna cannot do. If he can keep the sun located, floating in the sky, who can do that? We are proud that we can put a Sputnik in the sky for some time. But the Lord has taken a planet millions and millions and millions of times bigger than this earth, made of fire and floated in the sky and all of these other planets floating around it. What is it that the Lord cannot do? So for the pleasure of his devotees and to establish a most wonderful, enjoyable pastime for all the world, for all times to hear, he became a boar. Now this took place so many millions of years ago, but still, every year, on Varaha Dwadasi, we are discussing this wonderful pastime. Now what mortal man, through any of his activities, after millions and millions and millions of years, are people still talking about them? Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And we must know that this is not just some allegorical storytelling 
to depict certain lessons in life. The impersonalists preach like this. And the mundane scholars, that yes, these stories are very good because of the lessons to be learned from them. But there's no truth, there's no historical validity to these stories. But a devotee must boldly reject these ideas. Because unless we do, we cannot achieve real bhakti. All we'll get is some lessons, perhaps some moral and spiritual lessons. But love of God can only come from those who are striving to achieve real faith in the historical significance and validity of the Lord's wonderful, wonderful pastimes. So yes, Krishna did appear as such a bore, so beautiful. In this material world, bores are ugly. No one likes bores. We see in people's homes, we see pictures of dogs and pictures of cats and pictures of monkeys sometimes and pictures of cows and horses. Prabhupada actually said the horse is the most beautiful animal on earth. So people like to have such pictures. But we don't see people with pictures of hogs or boars in their house because they're just not very pleasing. They're dirty, they're ugly. They're basically gross. But when Krishna becomes a boar, he's so beautiful, so transcendentally beautiful, that he was attracting the hearts with unmotivated love of all the devotees and even the demigods. Demigods, they all have such beautiful apsara wives, but immediately all their attention and attraction became to the beautiful form of this boar. And then, after glancing his eyes upon all of his devotees, he began to dive into the ocean. And as he dove into the ocean, it explains the Garbodak Ocean appeared like it was being cut into two. So big, so magnanimous, so magnificent. And you see, boars, something like pigs, they like to eat dirty things in dirty places. And they use their nose to find out what smells the worst. And then they enjoy that. Of course. Srila Prabhupada explains that if one is indiscriminate in one's eating habits, one can take next birth like this. And with nose sounds they make, and that sound that they're making is just their nose just lustfully searching for the most abominable possible thing to eat and enjoy. But the Lord, on the bottom of the Garbodak Ocean with his nose searching for the earth, and he came to the earth planet, and in such a wonderful, beautiful, transcendental gesture, he lifted the earth upon his beautiful white tusks. And he began to carry the earth. Jayadev Goswami prays in his glorification. Vasati dashana sikare dharani tavalagna. Sashini kalanka kalevani magna. Keshavadrita suhukara rupa. Jaya Jagadhi Shahari Jaya Jagadhi Shahari Jaya Jagadhi Shahari Vasati Dashana Shikare Dharani Tavalagna Shashini Kalanka Kalevani Magna Keshavadrita Shukara Rupa Jaya Jagadish Hare Jaya Jagadish Hare Jaya Jagadish Hare Keshavadrita Shukara Rupa Jaya Jagadish Hare Jaya Jagadish Hare Jagati Shahari Hari Bhagavad 
Shavadrita Shukara Rupa Jaya Jagadi Shahare Jaya Jagadi Shahare Jaya Jagadi Shahare Hari Shavadrita Shukara Rupa Jaya Jagadi Shahare Jaya Jagadi Shahare Jaya Jagadi Shahare Shri Varaha Bhagavan Ki and as he was carrying the earth to bring it back to its respectable place, the great demon Hiranyaksha came to stop him. He called him an amphibious beast and he challenged him to fight. But the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the possessor of all six opulences in full. One of his opulences is renunciation. And the greatest form of renunciation is renunciation of our ego, our prestige. The Lord, for the sake of protecting the earth and all of the inhabitants of earth, was willing to accept such terrible, terrible humiliation from this monstrous demon who was insulting him with the most piercing, frightening words. And after the Lord placed the earth in its proper place, then he came back to fight with Hiranyaksha. And Maitreya Muni explains to Vidura the blow-by-blow -blow action of this great battle, which was something wonderful. And for those who like matches of two strong personalities, you will find the fulfillment of all your desires in this wonderful battle between Varahadeva and Hiranyaksha. There is no need to go to the world of wrestling Federation matches in Dadar. <laughs> I see these signs everywhere. These people, they're trying to imitate Hiranyaksha. <laughs> they put on all these masks and everything. But they're like little babies compared to Hiranyaksha. And they fight against each other. And in America, one of the largest money-making sports is boxing, where the people just beat each other with their fists and millions of people either go to the stadium or watch on television as they're seeing two strong personalities pounding and beating and punching each other. And practically most all athletic events, people trying to show their powers of how they can defeat another. And this is very attractive. Why is it attractive? Why are people attracted to such crazy thing of watching people beat each other and pound each other? It's because... Originally, we love to see the Lord having these fighting leelas with his devotees. But because we have lost our recognition of our relationship with God, we're trying to fill that thirst in our heart by seeing ordinary mundane people beating each other. And we make no spiritual advancement. In fact, we don't make any advancement. But by hearing the wonderful story of Varahadev fighting with Hiranyaksha, not only is it so enjoyable and wonderful and exciting and exhilarating to our mind and senses and heart, but also it purifies us and creates love of God from within us. It liberates us from the clutches of material existence. So they were pounding each other with their maces. And when their maces struck one another, it created such a resounding, echoing effect that it deafened the entire universe. And everyone was watching as spectators. 
the demons, they were all rooting for Hiranyaksha to win. And the demigods and the devotees, they were all pushing on the Lord to win. It was a great match. And at one time, Hiranyaksha created such a mystic arena where there was just volumes and volumes of terrible catastrophes all over the world, all coming toward the Lord. But the Lord, simply with his Sudarshan chakra, just spinning on his finger, the light of it made everything go away. And ultimately, the demigods, they were actually becoming very afraid because Hiranyaksha was so strong. They were praying, please, my Lord, please, now is the time, kill him. So although it was such a terrible, terrible fight, the Lord wanted to show that actually it is all my play. And just by touching him, gently touching him behind the ear with his hoof, hoof means a boar's hand is called a hoof, and then Hiranyaksha just became unconscious, and then the Lord gently stabbed him with his tusk, and he fell to the ground like a banyan tree uprooted by the wind and fell dead. Shivaraha Bhagavan Ki. And everyone was so relieved that Hiranyaksha is dead. And the higher living beings began to shower flowers upon the Lord. And then he again ascended into the sky and he assumed the form of a bluish Tamil tree. He became blue in complexion, the very complexion of Lord Narayan himself, just to show everyone that actually he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then after receiving the worship and the prayers of his devotees, he returned to the spiritual abode. We should know that when Jai and Vijay fell as Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu, who was killed by Varaha Dev and Narasimha Dev, next is Ravana and Kumbhakarna, who was killed by Lord Sri Ram, next as Dantavakra and Shishupal, who were killed by Krishna, they were not just ordinary demons. They were actually great devotees. And Jiva Goswami very, very extensively explains the nature of these six demons. And he explains how they were never covered by material energy. They were never actually in Maya. Because how could the Lord's devotees, who are taking part in the Lord's pastimes in this way, ever be covered by Maya? They were just like theatrical performers, just playing these roles. But in the inner core of their hearts, they actually knew their identities as the eternal servants of the Lord. And they were simply making a show of being terrible, terrible demons, just so the Lord would find pleasure in fighting with them and liberating them. And also, they were playing this role knowing that by behaving like this, they would attract the Supreme Personality of Godhead to come to the material world, which was his desire. Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskritam dharma samstapanarataya sambhavami juge juge. In order to protect my devotees and annihilate the demons and reestablish principles of religion, I descend. Ordinary demons, the Lord doesn't come down to kill. He doesn't waste his time. It is through time he destroys them or through some other means. But in order to exhibit beautiful, wonderful, magnificent pastimes that will attract all the world for all time to come, he comes as a half man, half lion. He comes as a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful boar. Why? just to attract our hearts and give pleasures to his devotees. But to make his pastimes very wonderful and exciting, he sent Vai and Vijay to play the role of Hiranyaksha, Hiranyakashipu, and these other demons. And we find in these demon forms, they were always thinking of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They were never forgetting him. As theatrical performers, just like Sometimes, even here at Radha Gopinath Temple, our devotees perform dramas. It's like in one drama, Adi Keshav was Hiranyakashipu. Yes? And Madhava was Prahlad. 
And Adi Kesha was actually blaspheming the Lord. He was actually blaspheming the Lord and blaspheming the greatest Vaishnavas. And Raghunath also. He was Hiranyakashipu. He was also blaspheming the Lord and his devotees terribly, threatening to kill and murder and everything. So we should know that although they were really playing the part, in fact, they won awards. <laughs> Nathji won the Academy Award for being Shukracharya, who was blaspheming Vamanadev. He was blaspheming the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And when we saw Raghunath and Adi Keshav, we were thinking, my God, Hiranyakashipu was empowering them. <laughs> their theatrical performance was so wonderful. They put their heart and their soul so much into being demons that some of our children were crying. They thought they were actually demons. So in the same way, Jai and Vijay took these roles and they played their parts so well that everyone thought they were demons. But actually, they were servants of the Lord, performing the wonderful pastimes of the Lord, just to attract our hearts and minds always to the service of his lotus feet. Tomorrow is Lord Nityananda Prabhu's appearance day. Of all the incarnations of the Lord who we are reading of, who are so wonderful, so transcendentally merciful, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda are considered the essence of all avatars. Parama Karuna Pahunduijan Nitai Gouda Chandra Hava Avatara Sarasiromani Kevala Ananda Kanda. That of all the various incarnations of the Lord, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda are Parama Karuna. They are supremely merciful. Because although in previous incarnations they killed demons and liberated them, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda have come to give pure love of God, Krishna Prema, to anyone who will simply accept. So tomorrow, please, everyone come to celebrate this glorious day of Sri Nityananda Charyodasi. Help us to celebrate in a wonderful way the glorious mercy of Sri Nityananda Prabhu in this world. And in this way, the Lord has come in so many wonderful ways to give us so many wonderful opportunities to come together to hear His glories and to chant His holy names. Actually, when the four Kumaras saw Lord Narayan, they remembered what their Guru Maharaj, Brahma, told them. Because Brahma was a pure devotee. Brahma was always discussing the glorious form and pastimes of the Lord. And they were always striving for that. But although they achieved liberation, they could not achieve that. But when they saw his beautiful form, they prayed to the Lord that everything Brahma has spoken in the glorification of your beautiful, beautiful personal form we have now realized by your divine grace. It is through the grace of the spiritual master that the beautiful darshan of the Lord is revealed. Jiva Goswami explains how having the darshan of the Lord is not necessarily seeing the Lord. Or we can say seeing the Lord is not necessarily having the darshan of the Lord. That is a better way of putting it. Because when Krishna was on this earth, so many people saw him, but they couldn't see him. When Krishna entered into the wrestling arena, Chanura and Mustika, they saw the body of Krishna and Balaram as strong and powerful as thunderbolts. Now a devotee sees the body of Krishna and Balaram as so soft and tender and gentle. So although they were seeing, they were not seeing at all. And sometimes people claim that I saw Krishna or I saw Prabhupada. Maybe they did, but they didn't. Jiva Goswami explains, you can understand who's actually seeing God or who's having divine revelation, not by just 
the experience, but by their qualities. If one is genuinely detached from material life, and one is genuinely attached to being the servant of the servant of the Lord with love, and has these qualities, we can understand that they can see Krishna. That they are seeing Krishna. Maybe within their hearts, or maybe the darshan of the Lord is upon them. But those who are still materially attached, even if they see Krishna face to face, or even if they have a vision and Krishna is playing his flute, they're not seeing Krishna at all. Krishna reveals himself by his divine grace according to the nature of our purity and our devotion. So sometimes people will say, I had a dream and Krishna came. And we think, and this person is not even following the principles of Krishna consciousness. And we're following so much and we're not having such dreams. Why? We should know that even if they're not lying, even if there was such a dream, they weren't seeing Krishna. Even if Krishna appears, he does not reveal himself unless our heart is sincere, humble, and devoted with bhakti. Therefore, in all instances, we must always keep this quality of consciousness first and foremost in our evaluation of everything. So the four Kumaras, they were explaining to the Lord that now what Brahma explained to us, we have realized by your divine grace. It is only by divine grace that the Lord makes himself available to his devotees. And it is only by divine grace that we have the good fortune of serving the Lord, his devotees, and chanting his holy names. Krishna, Krishna.